Welcome to 10 Minute I.O. where you'll find bite-sized information on all topics related to industrial organizational psychology. My name is Steve Jong. I'm an I.O. psychologist. Today's topic will be on psychometrics. For those of you familiar with assessments, you know there are hundreds if not thousands of assessments available out there. It can be pretty daunting to try and figure out what assessment is right for what population and what setting. My goal for this video is to help you clarify some of that confusion and to help you become a more savvy consumer of assessments. So let's start with the definition of psychometrics. Psychometrics, as you might have guessed, is the science or study of mental measurement, or more specifically, the design and evaluation of tools used for mental measurement. When I say tools, it could be as simple as a quiz or final exam in your classroom, or as complex as certification or licensure exams. So psychometricians are interested in designing tests and assessments that will accurately evaluate some of those qualities like intelligence, personality, values, and so on that make us all unique individuals. So why bother? Because we're all different. We not only differ in physical characteristics, but we differ in what we think about, how we think about those things, what we value, and what we're interested in, what gets us excited. So understanding these differences from a more objective perspective can be very helpful. From now, you may be wondering what assessments actually measure. One broad framework I like to use is the KSAO framework, which stands for knowledge, skills, abilities, and other qualities. Under knowledge, you have things like math, geography, history, and so on. Skills, you have driving skills, computer writing skills, abilities, you have intelligence, physical ability, and of course, in other qualities, you have personality, values, interest, and so on. Now, most assessments will tap into multiple areas simultaneously, so it's important to understand that these, uh, the, these categories uh, are not independent of one another. So where can we use assessments? I highlight here some of the most common areas where assessments can be used, but I'm sure you can think of many more. Employee selection, as an example. You may be curious about what the candidate knows, what he or she is able to do, and for certain job roles, personality can be extremely important. For mate selection or romantic relationships, you may be curious about whether or not your prospective partner holds the same set of values as you do when it comes to finances, religion, and family. Jumping down to the certifications and licensures, these are exams developed by industries, different industries, dental, medical, construction, legal. And these, are, these are exams designed to ensure a certain minimum level of competency so that once they reach a certification or license, they know that they're able to carry out certain tasks so that the individual companies don't have to necessarily um, test each one of the candidates that they're about to hire. Just to give you some actual examples of career-related assessments, I list five here, starting with the self-directed search, SDS, down to career assessment inventory, or CAI. To focus your attention on the second one, the strong interest inventory, this is probably one of the most widely used interest assessments. This was developed by Edward Strong back in the 1920s and revised uh, by Holland uh, later on with his six codes or typologies. And those codes are realistic, investigative, artistic, social, enterprising, and conventional. The idea is that most of us uh, have an interest that fall into some combination of those six areas. So when you take the assessment, you get a three-letter code, something like RIC, to stand for Realistic, Investigative, and Conventional. And once you have the code, it also guides you to particular career areas that are most likely, that you're most likely to find interesting uh, and, and, by extension, be more successful. As for the education-related assessments, I list six here, some of which you are familiar with, SAT, ACT, GRE, and so on. For the most part, these assessments are tapping into your verbal, mathematical, and analytical reasoning skills. What's important to remember about these assessments is that the more you practice, the better you can do on these. As for intelligence and ability-related assessments or tests, I list three here. 
the idea here is to measure people's processing power. If you can think of the human brain or the mind as analogous to a computer, so you have the uh, CPU, the processor, processor, and then you have the hard drive. It measures how quickly you can uh, process information as well as how much information can you actually cat catalog in your brain. The Wechsler's Adult Intelligence Scale weighs, I won't go into too much detail, but gets into such things as verbal comprehension, uh, mathematical reasoning, information processing, visual puzzles, block design, and so on. There's a number of different dimensions that it measures. The second one, Wonderlake Cognitive Ability Test, is mostly about general knowledge, something that you would see maybe in Jeopardy. The third one is called Raven's Matrices, and I give you some examples here, uh, three items that measure uh, pattern recognition, and these are this test is considered to be nonverbal or culture-free because as you can see in the first box you are asked to, or all three boxes, you're asked to identify uh, the next uh, pattern in the sequence showing. As for personality assessments, I list here some of the most popular ones, but there are a ton more than what's, what you see here. Among these, by far the most widely used is the first one, Big Five Inventory, that can be traced back over a hundred years to Francis Galton. It, one important thing to remember here is that the factors or the dimensions uh, measured by these personality assessments overlap to some degree. So for example, the Big Five has five main factors, uh, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, uh, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And the neuroticism, for example, from the Big Five inventory uh, would correlate with emotional stability in the 16 PF. Agreeableness from the Big Five would correlate well with warmth from the 16 PF and then steadiness from DISC. Uh, one more example, the CPI, there's a sociability dimension that would correlate naturally with extroversion from the Big Five. So keep that in mind. So how do you go about evaluating assessments for their quality, whether it's a good or bad test? There are two basic approaches to evaluating assessments and tests. One is reliability, the other is validity. Now these two ideas are fairly involved, so I'll have separate videos for reliability, separate video for validity. But suffice to say in this slide, Reliability of a test is the degree to which a test yields scores that are consistent. Now there are three ways, three main ways, there are other ways uh, as well, but three main ways to gauge the reliability. One is test retest, the other is internal consistency, and the third is parallel forms. Just to give you an idea, test retest just means that if you were to take the assessment today, a given assessment today, in, let's say in May of 2016, and you were to take the same test six months later in November, of 2016, the scores should be fairly similar and give you a consistent result over that time period. That's uh, the test retest reliability gauge. Uh, the other two we'll cover in later videos. Moving on to validity, the validity of a test is getting at the degree to which a test is actually measuring the concept that is that it is intending to measure. It's measured uh, using three different approaches. One is content-related validity, second is construct-related, third is criterion-related strategies. Again, I won't go in-depth into uh, each of those as they will come in later videos. So where do you go to find information on assessments? I list four major sources here. I won't go through each one of these in detail. Uh, just the first two. The test manual is associated with every assessment, commercially available assessment out there, and basically uh, gives you a summary of what the set assessment is about, some of the reliability and validity evidence. So if you are to use one of these, any of the assessments out there, you can contact the publisher to obtain a copy of the test manual. The second one, Mental Measurements Yearbook, is a, a document that's published by the Bureau's Institute. It's probably one of the most comprehensive uh, listing of commercially available assessments that's out there. Provides psychometric reviews, meaning reliability and validity data, the sample characteristics, and all that on hundreds of assessments that are out there being used. And they are written by test experts, so highly reliable in terms of, or uh, credible in terms of the information contained within. Now, we just have a couple more slides here, but I do want to make a clear distinction between high-stakes tests and general assessments. If you look at the first category here, high-stakes tests, 
These are tests that are associated with clear right or wrong answers. So SAT, GRE, medical board exams, and driver's license exams. They have clear right or wrong answers. There's no in-between. Uh, and they're also associated with monetary outcomes or, or serious consequences. So in this sense, they require the highest level of validity evidence and they must be legally defensible. In the second category shown here, class B or general assessments, uh, personality assessments, career, uh, leadership style assessments. As you can see, there are no clear right or wrong answers. And so, although they also need to be valid, they're a little more difficult to enforce from a legal standpoint. Uh, therefore, this distinction is very important. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this information to be helpful. Coming up next, we'll be talking about test reliability, so tune in soon.